This is the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock. And this is part 7 of Woe Unto You Lawyers by Fred Rodell from 1939. Out of print. This is part 7, chapter 8. More about legal language. Quote, They have no lawyers among them for they consider them as a sort of people whose profession it is to disguise matters, unquote, Sir Thomas More. Wow, that's back when the people had some discernment then. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, several years ago, was elucidating, in the course of the Court's opinion, a little point of law. He wrote, quote, Coming to consider the validity of the tax from this point of view, while not questioning at all that in common understanding it was direct merely on income and only indirect on property, it was held that, considering the substance of things, it was direct on property in a constitutional sense, since to burden an income by a tax was, from the point of substance, to burden the property from which the income was derived. And thus, are you lost? I'm lost. <laughs> Look at this legalese. And thus accomplish the very thing which the provision as to apportionment of direct taxes was adopted to prevent. Moreover, in addition, the conclusion reached in the Pollock case did not in any degree involve holding that income taxes generically and necessarily came within the class of direct taxes on property, but on the contrary. Recognize the fact that taxation on income was in its nature an excise entitled to be enforced as such unless and until it was concluded that to enforce it would amount to accomplishing the result which the requirement as to apportionment of direct taxation was adopted to prevent, in which case the duty would arise to disregard form and consider substance alone and hence subject the tax to the regulation as to apportionment which otherwise as an excise would not apply to it. From this in substance, it indisputably arises that the contention that the amendment treats the tax on income as a direct tax, although it is relieved from apportionment, and is necessarily therefore not subject to the rule of uniformity, as such rule only applies to taxes which are not direct, thus destroying the two great classifications which have been recognized and enforced from the beginning, is wholly without foundation since the command of the amendment that all income taxes shall not be subject to appointment by a consideration of the sources from which the taxed income may be derived forbids the application to such taxes of the rule applied in the Pollock case, by which alone such taxes were removed from the great class of excises, duties, and imposts subject to the rule of uniformity, and were placed under the other or direct class, unquote. <sighs> wow. <laughs> okay. Now, let's see what Fred Rodell has to say about that ridiculously verbose quote. This could go on for hours. As a matter of fact, it did. And incidentally, the legal point which the learned justice was making so crystal clear had not the slightest bearing on the decision in the case. But it would be far too easy to pile up example after example of the nonsense that is legal language. The quoted tidbit is, of course, an exaggerated instance, but it is exaggerated only in degree and not in kind. 
Almost all legal sentences, whether they appear in judges' opinions, written statutes, or ordinary bills of sale, have a way of reading as though they had been translated from the German by someone with a rather meager knowledge of English. Invariably, they are long. Invariably, they are awkward. Invariably and inevitably, they make plenty use of the abstract, fuzzy, clumsy words which are so essential to the solemn hocus-pocus of the law. Now, it is generally conceded that the purpose of language, whether written, spoken, or gestured, is that which conveys ideas from one person to another. The best kind of language, the best use of language, is that which conveys ideas most clearly and most completely, Gertrude Stein and James Joyce notwithstanding. But the language of the law seems almost deliberately designed to confuse and muddle the ideas it purports to convey. That quality of legal language can itself be useful on only one supposition. It can be useful only if the ideas themselves are so confused and muddled and empty that an attempt to express those ideas in clear, precise language would betray their true nature. In that case, muddiness of expression can serve very nicely to conceal muddiness of thought and no segment of the English language in use today is so muddy, so confusing, so hard to pin down to its supposed meaning as the language of the law. It ranges only from the ambiguous to the completely incomprehensible. To the non-lawyer, legal language is, as mentioned before, to all intents and purposes, a foreign tongue. It uses words and phrase which are totally unfamiliar to him, or it uses words and phrases which he can find in his vocabulary, but uses them in such a way that he is immediately aware that they must mean, in the law, something quite different from what they mean to him or on the rare occasions when a whole legal sentence seems to be made up of familiar words taken in their accustomed meaning, the sentence itself is likely to be so constructed that it doesn't make common sense. Oh, well, the non-lawyer will say with a shrug, I suppose it means something to be a lawyer. That is why people rarely bother to read insurance policies or mortgages or acts of Congress. They know perfectly well that they will never be able to grasp most of the ideas that are allegedly being conveyed. Even if a legally phrased document of one kind or another is of the utmost personal importance to the man who signs it or hears of it, he will seldom make the painful effort of trying to get clear in his head what the funny language in which it is written is supposed to mean. He will trust his lawyer or somebody else's lawyer that it does mean something, that it means something definite, and that there is a good reason for saying it in a way that prevents him from understanding it. Sometimes, moreover, he will later have cause to regret that blind trust. Yet why, if you think it over for a minute, should people not be privileged to understand completely and precisely any written laws that directly concern them, any business documents they have to sign, any code of rules and restrictions which applies to them and under which they perpetually live. Well, in the Old Testament, in God's law, it was written like that. 
when you go over to civil Babylonian law, good luck. Why should not the ideas, vitally important to someone as they always are, which are said to lie behind any glob of legal language, be common property, freely available to anyone interested, instead of being the private and secret possession of the legal fraternity? As pointed out previously, the law, regardless of any intellectual pretensions about it, does not, at bottom, deal with some esoteric or highly specialized field of activity, like the artistic valuation of symphonic music, or higher calculus, or biochemical experimentation. If it did, there would be reason and excuse for the use of language unfamiliar and unintelligible to ninety-nine people out of a hundred nor would the ninety-nine have any cause to care. But the fact is that law deals with the ordinary affairs of ordinary human beings carrying on their ordinary daily lives. Why, then, should the law use a language, language being, remember, no more than a means of communicating ideas, a language which ordinary human beings cannot hope to understand. Certainly, a man who enters a business deal of any kind, whether he is buying a radio on the installment plan, or setting up a trust fund to take care of his family, would seem entitled to know, to his own complete intellectual satisfaction, just what he is getting out of it, and just what he may be getting in for. The legal document he signs won't tell him. Certainly, a man whose democratically elected government enacts a law which will regulate him, or tax him, or do him a favor, would seem entitled to know, if he wants to know, exactly how the new statute is going to affect him. His lawyer may, quote-unquote, advise him, and may be right or wrong, but reading the statute won't tell him. Certainly, a man who loses a lawsuit would seem entitled to know why he lost it. The court's opinion won't tell him. Why? Why doesn't and why shouldn't legal language carry its message of meaning as clearly and fully as does a cookbook or an almanac or a column of classified advertisements to anyone who wants to know what ideas the words are intended to convey. The answer is, of course, that the chief function which legal language performs is not to convey ideas clearly, but rather to so conceal the confusion and vagueness and emptiness of legal thinking that the difficulties which beset any non-lawyer who tried to make sense out of the law seem to stem from the language itself instead of from the ideas, or lack of ideas, behind it. It is the big unfamiliar words, and the long looping sentences that turn the trick. Spoken or written with a straight face, as they always are, they give an appearance of deep and serious thought, regardless of the fact that they may be, in essence, utterly meaningless. Moreover, as has been mentioned previously, the lawyers themselves, almost without exception, are just as thoroughly taken in by the ponderous pomposity of legal language as are the laymen. They actually believe and will stoutly maintain that those great big wonderful words they are forever using convey great 
big, wonderful ideas to the initiated. If you can't talk Greek, they say, in effect, to the non-lawyers, then you can't really expect to understand us when we talk Greek. But don't for a second suppose that we don't understand each other perfectly and precisely. The catch is, of course, that the lawyers are not talking Greek or Russian or Sanskrit either. They are talking, in a fashion, English. Moreover, they are talking about matters, business matters, government matters, personal matters, matters which any non-lawyer is quite capable of comprehending. Furthermore, if they were talking Greek, they could presumably translate it accurately and intelligibly into a familiar tongue without spoiling or losing any of the sense. But they can't or won't translate the jargon of the law into plain workaday English. The communication of legal ideas, it appears, cannot be trusted to any conveyance but the lawyer's private patois, which is, unfortunately, all too true. For the law, as you may have heard before, is entirely made up of abstract general principles. None of those principles has any real or necessary relation to the solid substance of human affairs. All of them are so ambiguous, and many of them are so contradictory, that it is literally impossible to find a definite and sure solution, parenthesis, regardless of whether it might be a good solution or a bad solution, end parenthesis, a solution to the simplest, smallest practical problem anywhere in the mass of principles that compose the law. And the sole reason why that fact is not generally appreciated by either lawyers or non-lawyers is that the principles are phrased in a language which is not only bafflingly incomprehensible in its own right, but which is composed of words that have no real or necessary relation to the solid substance of human affairs either. Thus, the whole abracadabra of the law swings around a sort of circular paradox. Legal language, in statutes, documents, and court opinions, makes use of strange, unfamiliar words, because those words tie up to the abstract principles of which the law is composed. Except in reference to those principles, the words, as used, mean even less than nothing. But the principles themselves are utterly unintelligible, except in terms of the legal words in which they are phrased. Neither words nor principles have any direct relation to tangible earthly things. Like Alphonse and Gaston, they can do no more than keep bowing back and forth to each other. No wonder, then, that the lawyers can never translate their lingo into plain English, so that it means any sense at all. Asked what any legal word means, they would have to define it in the light of the principle or principles of law to which it refers. Asked what the principle means, they could scarcely explain it except in terms of the legal words in which it is expressed. For instance, the legal word title doesn't signify anything except insofar as it refers, among others, to the abstract principles that are said to determine to whom title belongs. Whereas the legal principle that, quote, title belongs to the mortgager, unquote, 
or the legal principle that, quote, title belongs to the mortgagee, unquote, for either may be, quote, unquote, true, doesn't signify anything either, unless you know what title means. Of course, there is one way, and only one way, to explain something of what a legal principle is supposed to mean in plain English. That is, to describe the specific lawsuits in which courts have made specific decisions, and have said they were making them on the basis of that principle. But the necessity of such a procedure immediately gives away the fact that the principles are intrinsically meaningless. For how on earth can a principle be the reason for a decision if it can only be defined by listing the decisions it was the reason for? No matter which way you slice it, the result remains the same. Legal language, wherever it happens to be used, is a hodgepodge of outlandish words and phrases, because those words and phrases are what the principles of the law are made of. The principles of the law are made of those outlandish words and phrases because they are not really reasons for decisions, but obscure and thoroughly unconvincing rationalizations of decisions. And if they were written in ordinary English, everybody could see how silly, how irrelevant and inconclusive they are. If everybody could see how silly legal principles are, the law would lose its dignity and then its power, and so would the lawyers. So legal language, by obstructing instead of assisting the communication of ideas, is very useful to the lawyers. It enables them to keep on saying nothing with an air of great importance and getting away with it. Yet the lawyers, taken as a whole, cannot by any means be accused of deliberately hoodwinking the public with their devious dialectic and their precious principles and their longiloquent language. They, too, are blissfully unaware that the sounds they make are essentially empty of meaning. And this is not so strange, for self-deception, especially if it is self-serving, is one of the easiest of arts. Consider the fact that the lawyers, and that includes the judges, have been rigorously trained for years in the hocus-pocus of legal language and legal principles. They have been taught the difficult technique of tossing those abstract words around. They have had drilled into their heads by constant catechism the omniscience and omnipotence of the law. They have seen and read that important people like Supreme Court justices and Wall Street law partners treat the law as seriously and deferentially as they treat the scriptures. Probably a lot more so, I would think. They discover, too, that all non-lawyers seem terribly impressed by this language, which sounds so unfamiliar and so important. So why ask questions? Why doubt that the world is flat when everyone else takes it as a matter of course? And especially, why doubt it if it is to your own personal advantage to accept and believe it, why not instead try to become a Supreme Court justice or a Wall Street law partner yourself? Every once in a while, however, a lawyer comes along who has the stubborn skepticism necessary to see through the whole solemn sleight of mind that is the law, 
and who has the temerity to say so. The greatest of these was the late Justice Holmes, especially where constitutional law was concerned. Time and again he would demolish a 50-page court opinion, written in sonorous legal sentences that piled abstract principle upon abstract principle, with a few words of dissent spoken in plain English. He would say, in effect, quote, The law as you lay it down sounds impressive and impeccable, but of course it really has nothing to do with the facts of the case, unquote. And the lawyers, though they had come to regard Holmes as the grand old man of their profession, and though they respected the legal writing he had done in his youth, were always bothered and bewildered when he dismissed a fine-spun skein of legal logic with a snap of his fingers. Strange as it may seem, it is his similar unwillingness to swallow the sacredness of the law that has turned the lawyers in a body viciously against Justice Black today. They do not hate him because he is a new dealer. So is Justice Reed, whom they respect. They do not hate him because he was a Ku Kluxer, Justice McReynolds is notorious and continuing racial intolerance, has brought no squawks from the legal clan. The lawyers hate Black because he too, without the age or the legal reputation of a Holmes to serve him as armor, has dared to doubt in print that there is universal truth behind accepted legal principles or solid substance behind legal language. They say of him, quote, why, that black doesn't even know the law, unquote, which only means that he knows the law too well for what it really is. What the lawyers care about in a judge or a fellow lawyer is that he play the legal game with the rest of them that he talk their talk and respect their rules and not go around sticking pins in their pretty principles. He can be a new dealer or a Ku Kluxer or a single taxer or an advocate of free love just so long as he stays within the familiar framework of legal phraseology in expressing his ideas and prejudices wherever they happen to impinge on the law. A lawyer who argues that sit-down strikes are perfectly legal, basing his entire argument on legal principles and phrasing it in legal language, and it can, of course, be done, will be accorded far more respect by his brethren than a lawyer who argues that men ought to be made to keep their business promises, but neglects to drag in the law of contracts to prove it. The kind of lawyer who is never lost for legal language, who never would think of countering a legal principle with a practical argument, but only with another legal principle, who would never dream of questioning any of the processes of the law, that kind of lawyer is the pride and joy of the profession. He is what almost every lawyer tries hardest to be. He is known as a, quote, lawyer's lawyer, unquote. Except in a purely professional capacity, in which capacity they can be both useful and expensive, you will do well to keep away from lawyers' lawyers. They are walking, talking exhibits of the lawyers' belief in their own nonsense. They are the epitome of the intellectual inbreeding that infests the whole legal fraternity. And since lawyers' lawyers are the idols of their fellows, 
It is small wonder that lawyers take their law and their legal talk in dead earnest. It is small wonder that they think a, quote, vested interest subject to be divested, unquote, or a frankly, quote, incorporeal hereditament, unquote, is as real and definite and substantial as a brick outhouse. For the sad fact is that almost every lawyer, in his heart and in his own small way, is a lawyer's lawyer. Thus, legal language works as a double protection of the mighty fraud of the law. On the one side, it keeps the non-lawyers from finding out that legal logic is so full of holes that it is practically one vast void. On the other side, the glib use of legal language is so universally accepted by the lawyers as the merit badge of their profession, the hallmark of the lawyer's lawyer, that they never stop to question the ideas that are said to lie behind the words. Being kept busy enough and contented enough trying to manipulate the words in imitation of their heroes. The truth is that legal language makes almost as little common sense to the lawyers as it does to the laymen. But how can any lawyer afford to admit that fact even to himself when his position in the community his prestige among his fellow craftsmen, and his own sense of self-respect all hang on the assumption that he does know what he is talking about. There is one more argument that a lawyer is likely to make in defense of the confusing and artificial words that make up legal language and, through legal language, legal principles, and through legal principles, the law. Watch out for it. Of course, he will grant, the law is built of abstract ideas and concepts and principles. And abstract ideas have to be expressed in special words. And the special words because they deal with abstract ideas, cannot be as precise of meaning as words that deal with solid things like rocks or restaurants or kitty cars. But what, he will ask, is wrong with that? Men are always thinking and talking in abstractions and using words like love or democracy or confusion or abstraction to convey their ideas. A quote-unquote contingent interest means as much to us lawyers as a quote-unquote friendly interest means to you. You can't define friendly interest very clearly or precisely either. Quote-unquote due process of law is just as definite as, quote-unquote, dictatorship. Constitutional or unconstitutional isn't any more ambiguous than good or bad. Moreover, he will go on, the whole ideal and purpose of the law is to maintain in human relations and affairs a well-known popular abstraction called justice. Try to define justice any more accurately than you can define any legal concept you can think of. As a matter of fact, the chief intent of the law, as a complicated science, is to make the idea of justice more precise to make it more readily and more certainly applicable to any fact situation, any problem, any dispute that may ever arise. 
And you can't split an abstract ideal into separate parts. You can't reduce it to principles and sub-principles without phrasing them in abstract and therefore somewhat imprecise terms, hence legal language. The answer to this defense of the law and its language is contained right in the defendant's own plea, even leaving aside the obvious fact that the law, time after time, produces results that strike most people as wickedly unfair or unjust, quote-unquote, in which case the lawyers invariably say, t -t too bad, but that's the law, all right. The answer is still there. The answer is that you can't split an abstract ideal into separate parts. You can't reduce it to principles and sub-principles, period. The whole business of trying to split up, quote-unquote, justice into parts or principles in order to get a better, surer grasp of it is as absurd as cutting up a worm in order to get a better hold on it. In the first place, the original animal is quickly disintegrated in the process. In the second place, each new little piece, each sub-principle, becomes a squirming abstraction in its own right. Each is now as hard to grab hold of, as hard to pin down to preciseness, as was the mother abstraction. Thus you will rarely find the lawyers, or the judges either, trying to apply the concept of justice to the settlement of a legal problem. Instead, you will find them fighting over a dozen equally abstract concepts, all phrased in legal language, of course, and trying to decide which of those should be applied. And, as noted before, the choice of the quote-unquote right concepts, or of the quote-unquote controlling principles, is a highly haphazard and arbitrary business, no matter how simple the facts of the problem. For facts don't fit into quote-unquote consideration or, quote, affectation with a public interest, unquote, any more automatically or certainly than they fit into, quote, unquote, justice. Moreover, and this is even more important, the concentration of the law on its own pet brood of concepts and principles has meant the sad disintegration of the old-fashioned non-legal idea of justice. Lawyers are always so absorbed in their little game of matching legal abstractions that they have all but forgotten the one abstraction which is their excuse for there being any laws at all. <laughs> this is exactly what happens when you replace the Mosaic Law with the Babylonian Law, isn't it? They take justice for granted and stick to their contracts and their torts. But you can no more take justice for granted than you can cut it up and stuff it into cubby holes of legal language. The lawyer who would defend the abstract language of the law is right as rain when he says that people think and talk of human conduct in abstract ways, in terms of right and wrong, fair and unfair. But he is dead wrong as soon as he asserts that the strange-sounding abstractions of the law have any more real or necessary relation to ideals about human conduct than they have to the facts of human conduct. Legal words and concepts and principles float in a purgatory of their own, halfway between the heaven of abstract ideals and the hell of plain facts and completely out of touch with both of them. 
And that is why, in the last analysis, the language of the law is inherently meaningless. It purports, on the one hand, to tie up in a general way with specific fact situations. It purports, on the other hand, to tie up in a general way to the great abstraction justice. Yet, in trying to bridge the gap between the facts and the abstraction, so that justice may be, quote-unquote, scientifically, and almost automatically applied to practical problems, the law has only succeeded in developing a liturgy of principles too far removed from the facts to have any meaning in relation to the facts and too far removed from the abstraction to make any sense in terms of justice. Still, Legal language is a great little language to those who live by it and on it. And you don't even have to use words like trover or assumpsit to have a lot of fun out of it. For instance, a bill recently before Congress contained this charming provision, quote, Throughout the act... The present tense includes the past and future tenses, and the future, the present. The masculine gender includes the feminine and neuter. The singular number includes the plural, and the plural, the singular, unquote. Only to a lawyer might, quote, the men are beating him, unquote, mean, among other things, quote, she is going to beat it, unquote. Hmm. Not sure about those last, that last sentence there, anyway. Okay, folks, that was part seven of Woe Unto You Lawyers by Fred Rodell from 1939, out of print. I'm Gordon Comstock. This has been the Ministry of Truth. <laughs>